Hi. Did you know that the audio of this sound actually spells the name of this channel on any XY oscilloscope? You can send some really important messages this way, or make mushrooms dance. Now, scope art aside, if you've seen my videos, you know that I use software voltage meters, scopes, and spectrum analyzers quite a lot as educational tools to explore instruments and identify and troubleshoot potential audio and control voltage issues. Korg's NTS-2 is an oscilloscope. It has two oscillators or LFOs, a spectrum analyzer, a tuner, and a multi-channel CV meter. In this video, I'll take a look at what it can do, the top reasons I use scopes, and talk a bit about its pros and cons in light of the alternatives, in particular, the software scopes that I use, which are free, but in some cases require special hardware, which this includes. Before I start, a quick disclosure, Korg sent the NTS-2 to me at no cost, along with their new patch and tweak book, which also happens to have an interesting patch by yours truly. Korg didn't pay me anything to make this video or be part of their book. They just asked if they could include a patch they saw in my ARP 26 video. So there's a description of this setup in the patch and tweak book and a full video walkthrough of it on my Patreon. Okay, let's start with an overview. The NTS-2 is a multifunction device. Like I mentioned earlier, it has a scope, two waveform generators, an FFT, meaning a spectrum analyzer, and a tuner for two signals simultaneously. Under the screen are five soft buttons, meaning that they have whatever function that's written above them on the screen. You tap multiple times to cycle between different parameters based on the page you're on. Then to the right of the screen, there's a push encoder. You use this typically to change parameter values. And uh, for example, here you can press it to toggle between a few features. Then there's the start stop button, which you can use to trigger the oscillators or to stop monitoring and freeze the scopes. The NTS-2 arrives as a kit that you need to build yourself. It doesn't require any soldering and everything you need comes included. The part where you need to break the board is the only part that's a little bit scary. It took me less than 20 minutes to build, including the time it takes to make coffee. The screws that come with it are a bit tiny, but luckily it comes with a tiny screwdriver. But if you get over that, it's quite simple. NTS-2 is powered either by USB or two AAA batteries. As you can see, everything is pre-soldered. I wish I could take credit for this. The side panels are PCBs, so don't apply too much pressure to them. Apply four more screws to the front and four more to the back. Four rubber feet go on the bottom and then comes the most important part. Not this, but this. NTS-2 also comes with two acrylic stands you can use to prop it up. It's easier for me to film it this way, but certainly these are useful to tilt it up. The screen is LCD, not OLED. It has pretty good viewing angles, but it does have the best contrast when you look at it head on. In terms of connectivity, NTS-2 has four inputs for CV or audio in two TRS inputs. You can use a splitter like this, which isn't included, to plug two mono inputs into each of the two stereo inputs in the back. Next to the two inputs, you have two passive stereo pass-through outputs, which replicate those four audio or CV channels back out so that you can still use them, not just measure them. Then you've got two more TS outputs, meaning mono outputs for audio and CV, which you can generate signals for using these two signal generators, meaning audio rate oscillators, LFOs, noise generator, a pulse, tempo synced if you want, and an envelope. So I'll talk about my tips and ideas, how I use scopes later on. Before that, let's take a deeper look at each of the NTS-2's functions. The first function is an oscilloscope. It has four modes, a overlay mode, separate two, separate four, and XY. If you have just one signal, you can patch a mono cable into one of the inputs. And one of the first things you're gonna to wanna to do is adjust the scope to the level that you plan to monitor. For line level, you're probably gonna to wanna to keep it at around one volt peak to peak or two volts, and for your rack, either five or 10. And it's a scope, so you can monitor waveforms, filtering, resonance, different shapes, different pulse widths. Now things get more interesting if you want to monitor more than one signal simultaneously. You can monitor two using the second input. To monitor four signals, you're gonna need two of these splitters sold separately. You can set the voltage ranges for each of the four inputs using this encoder when you are in display mode. Notice the noise here is because I set the range to 50 millivolts as opposed to five volts. You edit that in vertical, choose input two, and then 
go up to five volts. And then you hook up two mono cables to the um, tip and ring inputs on a cable like this. Tip is input number one and ring is input number two here. I'll plug this into Pam's workout, the expander, which will give us a bunch of fun clock rates. Now, right now we're viewing only one input at a time and you can choose which one. If you click the button, the encoder, the push encoder, you can choose two inputs at a time and then cycle through which ones you want to check out. But overlay mode makes it hard to see more than one signal at a time, which is why we have separate two and separate four. If this is moving too slow for us, we can change the time range for these. And just for fun, let's go for four signals at once. And then let's monitor these two. And if we play with the time scale, you'll be able to see all four at once based on their rate. And of course I could plug this, you know, any one of these to any other output, let's say go into here. So we've got this sort of exponential LFO or, you know, monitor anything else that's going on in the system that we want to take a look at. For example, the modulator output over here. So the signals can be totally independent. You'll notice the display is synced to the input. That's because I have trigger here uh, set to auto, which detects things very nicely. You can sync to only one of the four inputs and you choose that in the global settings. And I think we covered everything for these scope modes. You can choose, see this little tilde here on top of the five volts. You can choose whether the input monitor is AC coupled or DC coupled. And uh, you can do that for each of the inputs. Then one more thing, there's also a, uh, aside from the uh, time control, if you double tap this, you can control the position of the waveforms. So that's it for regular scopes. And then there's the scope art mode, the XY mode. So this is pretty cool. It takes two inputs and then just based on their levels draws um, a single shape and you can choose which input you would like to use. And each one shows different shapes based on what's flowing in here. And this is where you want to be if you want to binge on scope art or monitor a polygonal synthesis source. So if we take these two and plug them into X and Y here, and then we need to make sure we're monitoring the right two inputs. And let's maybe listen to this as well. The scopes are coming into input two, so I need to choose output two. And that's our sound. Now, I won't cover polygonal synthesis here. I made a whole video about that. And I see that my refresh rate is pretty slow. That's something that uh, I can fix right here. So let's make this a little bit more animated. And then you can make the shape bigger either by increasing levels on the source or by changing the voltage ranges using the uh, vertical option on both inputs. And for this and for scope art, there is a certain limitation on the overall resolution of the input of the DAC here, or the ADC, the analog to digital converter. So an analog scope, which works at light speeds, might be more faithful to the original signal, but this isn't too shabby. And if you've got a copy of Ableton Live with Max for Live, I'll add links to a few scope art resources in the description. Okay, let's move on to the next scope mode, which I use a lot in my videos. We'll skip ways for a bit, and that is the FFT. This mode only lets you view one input at a time, and it overlays a regular oscilloscope with an FFT, with a spectrum analyzer. Let's maybe increase the vertical resolution a bit. There we go. So whereas the scopes we saw before and this scope shows you levels over time, the FFT shows you levels across the frequency spectrum. So for example, this is what a sawtooth looks like. This is what it looks like when it's filtered and with resonance. Maybe we can kick up the vertical resolution just a bit more here. And uh, yeah, so sawtooth square noise filtered and unfiltered 
with a lot of resonance. You can see that peak scrolling across. You can't turn the um, the scope off here. I think it would be nice if you could. So you could see just the, um, the FFT. And then horizontal lets you either zoom into the scope, the waveform, or the waveform position, either left to right. And uh, then for the FFT, we've got the FFT range. So hopefully you can see these numbers on screen showing me zooming in and out to the frequency spectrum. Maybe if I change this, you'll be able to see it a little bit better. Then the last option is position, so you can shift the spectrum left and right. So it works as it should. Let's move on and talk about the tuner. That's pretty simple and straightforward. If you send it a signal, it'll tell you whether it's tuned or not. You can uh, view a scope simultaneously, which is a nice option. And you can see two uh, inputs simultaneously if you like. So let's take maybe the oscillator out in one input and then the modulator, second oscillator here. So you can view two sources at once and see their respective waveforms on top of each other as you tune them. And most importantly, you can calibrate the tuner if you want to be mathematically consistent with the universe. Okay, let's move on to the last function or functions of NTS2, and that is its two waveform generators. Now, theoretically, we'd need another NTS2 to monitor the output of these waveforms, but Korg missed out on a revenue opportunity here by letting us patch the output of the uh, either one to back into the input. The NTS2 has two waveform generators. They're both identical. You can't trigger or control these with incoming, obviously not MIDI because there's no MIDI input here, but not even with CV or voltage triggers. So you can't quite play these unless you want to play them with a the knob or trigger them with this button, but they can still be useful within the context of a setup. Let's take a look at what it can do. Now to see the input on this scope, just go into the input monitor and select the right input. And now we can see a waveform of what's coming through. This button, by the way, has a few modes, either continuous or um, one shot, and then push, so it only works when I press the button. You can set the uh, volume, and then when you look at the shape, you've got a few options, sine, square, triangle, and a couple of saws. And then pitch can either be tuned like this, or like I mentioned earlier, by notes. So a nice bassy saw, but uh, yeah, at least currently, this is the only way you can play it. And there's a nice wave shaping option. So a nice thing that there's a scope here to verify that things are going as they should. And you've got phase control as well. So that's the oscillator. Let's look at the LFO. A uh, few options here. Let's edit it. So let's take a look at the waveforms. And at audio rates, we can hear the LFO, of course. Square, triangle, saw. Same shapes, basically. It would have been nice, I think, uh, had there been a sample and hold LFO here. Then there's rates, and you really want to lower this to have it be an LFO. And the nice feature here is that if you press this button, you can tempo sync it, which is nice to have if your setup doesn't have a tempo synced LFO. Then you've got polarity and phase. So that's LFO mode. Let's uh, move on to the next one. Noise, white noise, and pink noise. And then you've got a time parameter, which doesn't do anything unless we go into the duty cycle. I have no idea why you'd want this, but you can. Please comment below if you can figure this one out. And this can be tempo synced as well. Next up is pulse mode. This can be used presumably as, um, as a clock. And um, yeah, positive and negative. You have a tempo control here. And uh, duty cycle function, which of course makes me want to kick the tempo right up and engage in some manual PWM. And then the final mode is envelope mode. 
and uh, a few features here, linear or exponential. If it's not in one shot mode, then it'll loop. So uh, you can make a tone with this. And there's me <laughs> loving the subharmonic series here. Again, all this only manual control, so it won't replace your subharmonic on anytime soon. Aside from curved type control, you've got shape control. Let's maybe make this a little bit more bassy. And uh, a duty cycle function here as well to shape the waveform. So really cool stuff, but no voltage control and no voltage triggers. I don't know if they can add that in a firmware update, but it would, I think, make this much more useful. Before we head out to the tips section, let's maybe just look at the global parameters. Uh, you saw earlier you can control coupling, AC coupled or DC coupled in the scope mode, so you don't need to enter this. You want to use AC coupling for audio and DC coupling for voltage. Then there's a low pass filter for each input, a few other settings, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, assembled by you. Okay, before I head out to the pros and cons, I just wanted to share with you a few quick ways that I use scopes. So the first thing I do with scopes is nothing, or more precisely, see what noise levels this has without anything plugged into it. And you can zoom into, um, into the noise, like I mentioned earlier, by reducing the voltage ranges. So this is natural noise for the NTS2. And if we go into um, the uh, FFT mode, then here too, you can see that both on the uh, scope and on the... Um, on the FFT. So that little bump is there. It's just a matter of signal to noise ratio. And then I plug something in and check that out. So this clearly is way higher than the levels of um, whatever was interfering with this earlier. Anyway, so bottom line, I like to see a clean scope with no odd frequencies, ground loops, USB noise, which may make crazy peaks here. This is a great way to see how clean your signal is. So yes, I listen to my signals, obviously, but I also take a look at the scopes to make sure they're clean. The next thing I do is monitor levels, especially if I'm connecting Eurorack and non-Eurorack gear. So as you can see on the scope, we're looking at a two volt range, which may or may not be safe, depending on where I want to plug this into. And if I add drive and resonance, things may get even louder. Low pass boost, you can see levels play with this a bit you can see levels are quite a bit higher it may not be safe to send five or ten volts to your audio interface then the next and main thing i use scopes for obviously is to see the sounds if we look at a food analogy theoretically we shouldn't care what our food looks like but if you've ever tried to eat blindfolded you'll know it's quite a different experience same goes for sounds resonance i think can be a tricky topic to understand this makes understanding what's going on a little bit easier with some filters, resonance will duck the level of waveform, so this lets you see that pretty nicely. Maybe if we get a little bit better vertical resolution. So notice, as I increase resonance, the overall level of the fundamental drops. No resonance with resonance. Similarly, for FM and wave folding. Of course, it's nice to hear the sound, but I think it helps to see it as well to get an understanding of uh, of what wave folding does to a wave shape. Let's say we go for this. As opposed to, for example, FM, which totally messes with the uh, frequency spectrum. Let's maybe play a higher note. as well as the ratio between the uh, oscillators. This is what happens to the frequency spectrum when the carrier stays the same, but the frequency of the modulator changes. I think all those terms just come to life when you see things on a scope. And then, of course, monitoring control voltage is another important reason to use uh, scopes. We can see the shape of this LFO, for example, or what happens when we set it to modulate itself and increase the intensity of that mod? So this gives you a pretty good look at the uh, 
at the wave shape that that makes. Many modules don't have feedback on what's coming in or going out of the outputs. Those that do have blinking lights, which is nice, but I think this lets you take a really good look at the behavior of control voltage over time. So those are the main reasons I use scopes. One little tip specifically for the NTS2, if you use an external effect with it, then connect the scopes before you uh, process it with effects, then take the pass through and pass that into your effect or anything else. Reverb is beautiful, but it turns audio into mush and makes it hard to see waveforms clearly. Okay, let's take a look at the pros and cons for NTS2. On the pros side, if you've seen this channel, it's no secret that I think scopes are a must have synthesis educational tool. I've been using free software scopes from Melda and VCVRAC. So the main disadvantage or con for NTS2 compared to those is that it's not free. And the big advantage, of course, is that it's small, portable, doesn't need a computer, DAW and plugins set up running nearby. Another big advantage for NTS2 is that its inputs are DC coupled, meaning that you can view and monitor LFOs, envelopes, and other modulation signals. If you want to do that with a computer, you need an audio interface with DC coupled inputs. The only ones I know of that have that feature are modules from Expert Sleepers and the Optics ADAT expander from BoardBrain. If you don't have those and plug in modulation into your computer, assuming voltage levels aren't too high, it still won't see the modulation properly because its inputs will be AC coupled, not DC coupled. Another advantage for the NTS2 are the pass-throughs, so you can place it wherever you want in the signal chain in a hardware setup. One thing you should know about the pass-throughs is that they're passive. This means they work when the unit is off, which is a good thing, but if you need them to be buffered, for example, if you're using them to look at volt per octave signals, you might want to use a buffered mult instead of the pass-through if your synths start getting out of tune. Speaking of tuning, the tuner is a useful feature, especially in the context of Eurorack, and it's good that you can tune two oscillators at once. And the waveforms are also a nice bonus. It would be nice, like I mentioned earlier, if you could play them with CV and trigger them with incoming voltage. And yet, if you need two tempo sync LFOs, this may cost less than most modules. And as odd as it sounds, even this button is useful just to trigger envelopes or trigger events in the Eurorack system. So that's it for NTS2. If you liked the insights in this video, there are plenty more in my ever-expanding book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks available to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. You might want to consider smashing the like button if this video was useful, and definitely ring the YouTube bell below if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.